Hello, welcome to ChemBio and to A-Level Biology Revision. Chapter 4 is about enzymes, and in this video we'll go through the mechanism of their action and the factors affecting their activity. Stay tuned. Many chemical reactions require quite specific conditions in order for them to take place at a fast rate, for example high temperature or high pressure. Well, in industry this is very often just hard to achieve because it's expensive or it can even be unsafe. Well, in an organism, in our body, there's no chance that we're going to increase our body temperature to 100 degrees Celsius, no way. And this is where the role of enzymes comes in. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So they're globular proteins that increase the rate of a metabolic reaction by lowering the EA. This is quite simply the definition of the term enzyme. Let's break it down. First of all, biological catalysts. Well, catalysts, as you should remember from GCSE chemistry, are substances that speed up the rate of a chemical reaction without being used up themselves. Biological just refers to the fact that it's a biological molecule, and very often enzymes are proteins. Some aren't, some are actually ribonucleic acids, but they're exceptions. In the majority of cases, they are indeed proteins. And the rest of the definition is quite simply what a catalyst is. It increases the rate of a reaction by lowering the activation energy. That's what EA is. We then divide enzymes into two categories. First of all, enzymes can be intracellular. And as you've guessed, these are enzymes that work inside of the cell. And a very good example is DNA polymerase, which is involved in DNA replication, and that of course takes place in the nucleus, so in the cell. They are synthesized and retained in the cell. Extracellular enzymes, on the other hand, will work outside of the cell, for example digestive enzymes. Both of them are synthesized inside the cell, it's just that intracellular enzymes stay in the cell, extracellular enzymes will just leave the cell via exocytosis to go and do their job elsewhere. Now, enzymes can catalyze two types of reactions, anabolic reactions or catabolic reactions. Anabolic reactions have this general format. A plus B gives AB, where we have two reagents, A and B, two substrates to produce one product, AB. So in general, we can say that these are build-up reactions. For example, growth, when we have several reagents that join together to form one product, that type of reaction is anabolic. Anabolic reactions are also endothermic. That means that they take in energy. And if you're ever asked to identify an anabolic reaction from a graph, then it will be like this. This is an energy profile diagram for an endothermic reaction, where you can see that the reagents have less energy than the products. In other words, energy has been taken in. Catabolic reactions, on the other hand, will be exothermic, therefore, and have this general format. CD gives C plus D where we have one reagent that is split into two products or several products. So these are breaking down reactions, for example, energy release or digestion. And this is what the energy profile diagram would look like. As you can see, the products have less energy than the reagents. The term metabolism just refers to the sum of all chemical reactions in an organism. So the collective total of all the reactions that take place in an organism that is referred to as metabolism. Enzymes catalyze both anabolic and catabolic reactions. So now let's actually take a look at how the enzymes work. And we did touch on this at GCSC when we saw the lock and key mechanism. So if you remember, we had our enzyme, we had the substrate, the substrate would come along, attach to the active site, a reaction would take place, products form, products get released. Why is it called lock and key? Well, quite simply, because a lock fits into a key perfectly, just like a substrate fits to an enzyme perfectly. The shapes are the same. At A level, we have to go into a bit more detail. We have to say that the shape of the substrate molecule is complementary to the enzyme's active site. And please say enzyme's active site, not enzyme. The shape of the substrate molecule is only complementary to the place where the reaction takes place, and that is, of course, the active site. We then have to say that the substrate collides with the enzyme and binds to the active site, forming an enzyme-substrate complex. That's the term that we have to use. Then the reaction takes place 
and then we form an enzyme product complex. Finally, the products are released and the enzyme remains unchanged. This means that it can be used for further reactions. Quite simple, really. Pretty much the same idea as GCC, it's just this time we have to include a few other bits of terminology. Now, the lock and key mechanism isn't actually quite right. Enzymes don't really work in this way. Recently, there has been new evidence that supports a different theory, and that is called the induced fit hypothesis. The idea is pretty much the same, it's just there are a few slight differences. So take a look at how it works. Here is the same enzyme and we have our substrate. As you can see, the shape of the substrate is this time not complementary to the enzyme's active site. The shapes are slightly different. So when the substrate comes along and tries to bind to the enzyme's active site, it won't work because the shapes aren't complementary. What happens then is the enzyme changes its tertiary structure, so its shape also changes like this. Now, as you can see, the shape of the active site is fully complementary to the substrate. Now the reaction can take place, the products form and get released. So as you can see on the whole, the idea is generally the same. It's just that initially the shape of the enzyme's active site isn't quite complementary to the substrate. It then changes so that then everything can fit together well and the reaction can take place. If we are answering an exam question, then this is what we say. The shape of the substrate molecule is almost complementary to the enzyme's active site. The substrate collides with the enzyme and binds to the active site. Then, key point, the enzyme undergoes conformational changes to its tertiary structure. In this way, the active site changes shape to fit the substrate. Now they're going to be complementary. Now, because the enzyme changes its 3D shape, its tertiary structure, as a result, we get a straining and pressuring of the substrate and hence its bonds get weakened and broken. Yes? So when this enzyme wraps around the substrate, so to speak, it needs to change its shape, it vibrates, it moves around, it tries to fold and match the substrate, and all of these actions, they put pressure onto the substrate molecule. And that causes the bonds in the molecule of the substrate to weaken and eventually break. And this is how enzymes lower the activation energy. Activation energy, remember, is just the energy required for the reaction to take place, so to break all the bonds in the reagents. And the enzyme does this for us. It weakens the bonds and breaks them, all because it can change its tertiary structure just to fit the shape of the substrate, and as a result of that, the bonds get weakened. Then the reaction takes place, and then we can form our enzyme product complex. So be sure to learn this process, it's a very common exam question. If, by the way, you ever get asked to describe or explain how an enzyme works, you always talk about this method. You always talk about the induced fit hypothesis unless specified, unless they say explain using lock and key mechanism how an enzyme works. Then, of course, you talk about the other way. Otherwise, stick to this. This is your go to. OK, now we've seen how enzymes work, let's talk about some other factors, some external factors that affect their activity. We did look at this at GCSE very briefly, now let's go into a bit more detail. First of all, as you know, this is temperature. At GCSE, of course, we talked about all of this enzymes denaturing when temperature increases and so on and so on. Now we have to be specific. An increase in temperature causes the kinetic energy of the particles to increase. As a result of that, the particles collide and move faster. Yes, it's quite straightforward, really. Kinetic energy increases, therefore they move more, they move faster, they move with more energy. That directly means that they're going to collide faster and more frequently. And yes, our frequency of successful collisions increases. Therefore, the rate of enzyme catalyzed reaction also increases. But we know that this isn't always true. At very high temperatures, there will be quite a large increase in kinetic energy. And that causes vibration in the bonds of the enzyme molecule. This again strains the bonds and they break. Since the bonds break, we have a change in tertiary structure. That means that the active site will no longer be complementary to the substrate. The enzyme substrate complexes can therefore not be formed because the substrate can't attach to the enzyme's active site. We can say therefore that the enzyme has denatured. Now be very careful, if you're ever talking about low temperatures, never say that the enzyme has denatured, that is wrong. Enzymes at lower temperatures are just less active because there is a lower kinetic energy, yes? They're just moving slower and therefore the reaction takes place at a slower rate. 
No denaturation happens here at all. Okay, be very careful there. So now let's plot a graph of temperature against rate. So we can see that as temperature increases, so does the rate of the reaction, but only up to a certain point. After that point, we get a rapid decrease in rate of the reaction right until it falls to zero. That is when our enzyme denatures, okay? Now, if we were to have a look at a certain temperature, let's call that T1, using interpolation, we can read off what the rate will be at that specific temperature. We'll call that V1. Capital V is just the symbol for rate. Let's then take another temperature, T2, interpolate again, we'll read off our rate, V2. Now, if we select T1 and T2 such that they are 10 degrees apart, we can then divide V2 by V1, and we will get a certain value called Q10. In enzymology, Q10 is the measure of increase of rate for every increase in temperature by 10 degrees. So basically, this is a value, this is a quantitative representation of how the temperature affects the rate of the reaction. So this means, for every 10 degrees increase in temperature, by how much does our rate of reaction increase? In other words, if Q10 is 2, that means that for every 10 degrees increase, the rate of reaction doubles. If it's 3, then it trebles. If it's 4, then it quadruples, and so on. However, this only applies up to the optimum temperature when the enzyme has not yet denatured. When it has denatured, then of course this does not apply. So many exam questions do indeed ask you to calculate Q10. Very simple, this is the formula. It's V2 divided by V1, where V2 is 10 degrees higher of the temperature of T2 than T1. That's it. And indeed, in the majority of cases, enzymes will have a Q10 of around 2, but not always. And if you do get an exam question that is a multiple choice question, where you have to determine Q10, there will always be one option where V2 and V1 are swapped the opposite way round. So that just in case you do make that mistake, you won't know that you've made that mistake because there will be that answer there. So be very careful. Make sure you check your calculations. The next factor is pH. However, we need to be able to explain why pH affects the activity. So first of all, what is pH? pH is a measure of hydrogen ion concentration, yes? This means that if we change our pH, there will be a change in H plus ion concentration, quite simply. This affects the charge of the acidic or alkaline or even the charged R groups of the amino acids of the enzyme. So as we know, enzymes are proteins, in most cases, and proteins, they are long chains of amino acids folded into a certain shape. And those amino acids have residual groups, R groups. Some of them are charged, some of them are polar, some of them are hydrophobic, some of them are alkaline, some of them are acidic. They have all these different properties. And the H plus ions will ultimately affect these R groups in some way. There is some kind of interaction. And this means that the ionic or hydrogen bonds between the R groups can be weakened or broken or just affected in such a way that then the tertiary structure alters. That means, therefore, as we know already, that the active site is no longer complementary to the substrate, and we say again that the enzyme has denatured. An interesting point here is that if pH changes are minor, the enzyme can actually return back to its original shape after denaturation, if we return the conditions back to normal, of course, and that is referred to as renaturation. So if we now plot a graph of pH against rate again, we can see that we have an increase up to a certain pH and then again a decrease. This time the curve is a bit more bell-shaped. Again, we have our optimum pH somewhere in the middle and every enzyme will have its very own optimum pH. Some enzymes that work in the stomach, for example, where the pH is very low, they will be adapted to that pH and their optimum pH will be something like two, for example. Other enzymes will have it higher. And the same actually goes for temperature. Some organisms who live in very cold environments will have to have enzymes that work at lower temperatures, likewise with organisms who live in warmer environments. So all enzymes are different, that is indeed a fact. So the last factor now is concentration of either the substrate or the enzyme. If we're talking about substrate concentration, then quite simply, a higher concentration means that we have more substrate particles in a given area or volume, yes? Let's say we have a container of a certain volume. If we have a set number of enzymes in that, that will be one concentration. If we increase the number of enzymes in that same container, that is an increased concentration. This means that the particles are more likely to collide, quite simply because there are more of them. This means that the frequency of successful collisions 
also increases and therefore the rate of the reaction does as well. If it's the concentration of the enzyme, well, we talk about the increased availability of the active sites. If there are more enzymes, there are more active sites available. So substrates can come to these free active sites in order for them to get um, changed into the product. This means that enzyme substrate complexes can form at a faster rate and therefore the reaction takes place at a faster rate as well. However, this only applies if the substrate concentration is in excess. Think about it, if we have many enzymes but only a very small amount of substrate, it doesn't matter how many more enzymes we add, only a certain number of the enzymes will be used to catalyze this reaction because we only have a set amount of uh, substrate. And likewise goes for substrate concentration. It doesn't matter how many more uh, substrate molecules we add, if there is only a set number of enzymes available, then only those will be able to catalyze the reaction. All the other substrate molecules will have to wait for the enzymes to become available. So we can talk here about limiting factors. Let's plot a graph and see what I mean. We have substrate on the x-axis and rate again on the y-axis. We can see that we have an increase in rate of reaction as we increase our substrate concentration and then it levels off. We have a plateau. And that plateau is referred to as V max, the maximum rate of reaction. Why is that? Well, quite simply, as mentioned already, it's because all the active sites are occupied. Further increase in substrate or enzyme concentration has no effect. We can say that that becomes the limiting factor. The only other way that we can increase the rate of reaction now is by increasing temperature or pH to the optimum for the given enzyme. So that is it for this first part on enzymes. There will be two more videos on inhibition and cofactors. If you're wondering about all the required practicals, they will be in a separate video. All the PAGs will have separate videos for them eventually. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments. Thank you very much for liking and subscribing. See you next time. Goodbye.